Okay, let's go ahead and start. Uh, we'll get going. Um, so the topic of this module, um, well, it's, this is a shorter module, the final module before um, the final kind of synthesis uh, module that Anna and I will both run. And the topic of this module is, is modeling. And, and um, this is a very kind of short introduction, like, you know, way less, it, this gives modeling really short shrift. This comes from somebody who is a modeler. Um, and so uh, in Dingman, Uh, it's Appendix F. Is uh, simulation modeling. And so today, um, we're going to talk about, um, or we'll answer the questions, uh, what is a model? And why do we model? Um, and then we'll get into uh, fundamental types of models. Okay. Okay. Any questions at this point? Okay. All right, so let's start off with with what is a model? What is a model? Okay, um, and it, it's it's kind of most basic core, right? If if you think about um, the answer to this question, could get very philosophical very quickly, right? Um, because uh, there's there's lots of different sort of conceptions of what a model is, and in fact, like you know, there's a um, there's a model, to get meta for a second, there's a model of the way that sort of the human brain and cognition works, right, in that all of us are sort of building, you know, you probably heard the term mental models, right? Um, we build mental models of the way that the world works, right, the way that, uh, you know, people will react to, you know, something we say, right, or... Uh, you know, e even sort of uh, s simple, um, uh, even sort of simple interactions with inanimate objects, right? right? We, we build mental models that allow us to predict how the world works, right? And so to give you a very sort of fundamental example of this, right? Something that you encounter every day, okay, so... Um, let's say that you are coming up to, or you, you're going to this kind of like hole in the wall restaurant, right? It's a greasy spoon breakfast place. People are ranting and raving about how great it is. Um, it's, 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 you know, in an old, it's a, you know, it occupies space in an old building, right? That is, um, you know, some, some place in downtown Boise, okay? And you walk up to go into this restaurant and there's a door there and the door doesn't have any labels as to whether or not it's, it's push or pull, okay? So, well, first of all, like, what is your, men what is a, a, a mental model sort of tell you to do? Well, first off, all, all, our mental model says it should be either one, right? Okay. And then so what, what is a totally natural thing to do? Is to try one, right? 
So it's not labeled, right? It's, it maybe has that little bar handle, so it could be either. So you push it, and it doesn't work. And so then what? Pull you pull on it, right? So what did we do in that sort of loop, right? What, you know, how is that related to modeling? Well, our mental model told us that this was a door and that a door should have a hinge. That's not the only kind of door, right? There's sliding glass doors, there's big garage doors. But our mental model said, this is a kind of door that should be hinged. It should either function as a push or a pull, right? So that was our mental model. We made a prediction at first that this was a push entry, right? We tried that, it didn't work. That was collecting some data. Right? We were actually collecting actual observations in that circumstance. We pushed on the door. Our mental model told us to, to push on the door. It did not open. So our mental model then tells us uh, to pull on it. Right? Okay, so let's say you pull on it and it then doesn't work again. Okay, what might our mental model sort of say after we've conducted both of those experiments, right? We've made two forecasts. Both of those forecasts are incorrect. We need to use that information to update our mental model. What are some possible sort of hypotheses that might be true after both of those entry modes kind of fail? What might your mental model lead you to conclude? It's, open. it's closed, right? Okay. So. That in and, its, in and of itself, right, illustrates some sort of key features of a model, right? So a model is just um, an abstraction of reality So what did I mean in, what do I mean by abstraction of reality? Well, what I, what I mean is that... Right? We abstracted how that door works, and in, in our model, we developed sort of a vision of, of the way that it should function. Right? We developed some kind of you know, model in our mind, some pathway of, of neurons that connected that say, hey, either this should, should push open, it should pull open, and if neither of those work, then I need to kind of check the hours and maybe peek inside to see if, in fact, this restaurant is closed. So... It's not reality, it's an abstraction of reality, okay? And, and it, but it represents kind of a physical system, okay? Um, what does that, what did that mental model allow us to do? What is kind of the key, what's the key attribute of that model? What did it allow us to do right when we stepped up to the door? Yeah, so it allows us to make predictions. And we'll say, quote unquote, real world predictions. And then what was kind of the final attribute of that, right? So, okay. We have this mental model. It's an abstraction of the way that a door works. It allows us to make a prediction that, hey, this, this door should either open or close. What was kind of the, what was the, the key, what's the key attribute of that, right, of that mental model and that ability to make predictions? Like, was that a prediction of, like, this is the molecular or atomic level composition of this door? Was it a prediction of, you know, the metaphysical state of this door as being sort of either existing in the physical plane or not? Like, what was, what's the key thing that that, so we made a prediction, and then what did we do? We tested that prediction, and, and that allowed us to collect data. Right, and so a key facet of a model, right, is that um, it's comparable to observations, 
Um, and those observations inform the accuracy of the model, right? So that's a key, that's a key sort of feature, right? If we, if we drew a diagram, and this is our model, right? This makes a prediction Okay, and then that prediction should be of something that's actually observable, right? So this is, this is data, and this is observation, okay? And that, in turn, allows us to update our model, right? So a key attribute of a model, the key attributes of the model are that it represents some system. It makes predictions of things that are uh, observable, right, Ab about which we can collect data. And that data should help us inform or guide the updating of that model to make better predictions, okay? So there's a lot we're not going to be talking about with respect to, like, that update because there's some pretty fundamental things about updating our, our mental model, right? So um, to, just to give you an idea of like mental models and how this relates, in, in a simple sense, our mental model of a door, right, just told us, hey, make a prediction, okay, uh, push on the door, that didn't work, okay, update, pull on the door, Okay, that did work. Okay, so that's a, that's a relatively sort of um, simplistic model of like whether or not the door is a push or pull, okay? But even more fundamental than that, so that's a kind of an update, right? That's just sort of the state of the door as being a push open or pull open. But if you get, you know, into kind of more, you know, the development of models, okay, um, what we might call this, the structural nature of a model, for instance, um, you know, as, as a parent, right, you watch your kids kind of grow up and they're developing mental models of the world. So a, a, a very common one, right, that we talk about is that, uh, is, is that of the oven, right? Like the oven that's on, right? And you know, there being some value to a kid reaching out and touching that oven and discovering that it is hot, okay? So they maybe didn't have any prior conception. There was no previous mental model of what a, an oven or a stovetop is, okay? Um, but their priors, their only mental, of the, mental model of the world is, hey, I go out and I touch stuff. They touched the top of this stovetop and it was hot, that induced some pain, and they update their mental model, right? And what did they update their mental model to, to say or do? You shouldn't, touch the stove. you shouldn't touch the stove, right? So that's a kind of structural update to the model, right? The kid, presumably now, I mean, it may require a couple iterations, especially if it's my little boy, right? That's a structural update that says, hey, there's this boxy thing in the kitchen and I touched it and it was painful, so don't touch it anymore, right? So that's kind of a structural update as opposed to kind of like a simple update of like, hey, this is a push or pull door, right? So there's a whole bunch that that applies to, right? We could draw analogies to with respect to hydrologic simulation models. Um, and we're not gonna get into that. I teach a modeling class every other fall um, that delves into kind of some of these attributes is Geos 518. So if you're interested in that, let me know. It actually won't be offered until fall 2024 because I'm on sabbatical next year. But if you're still around then, let me know and we talk about some of these things. You also talk about some of these things in some other classes. Um, 
Uh, Michael X. Strand, I think, teaches uh, machine learning. Is that right? My machine learning data science class, right? Um, or Casey um, Kennington, Pennington, Kennington? Yeah, yeah. So there's some folks in, in computer science that sort of teach this in the context of machine learning models. It's a lot of the same thing, right? So they'll talk about some of these parametric uncertainty versus structural kind of uncertainty. We'll talk a little bit about that. But um, there's a whole lot we're going to be missing here today and then the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of a high level sort of 50,000 foot overview of what a model is. Let's zoom down into our particular class, which is hydrology. And, and what I want to do now is I want to do kind of one fundamental thing, two fundamental things. I want to, to, to kind of benchmark us back to where we started at the beginning of the semester with respect to kind of what we're studying in, in hydrology. Um, and I want to do that by drawing a picture, right? So the, this is what is a hydrologic model. Okay. And I'm going to start off by drawing our... Uh, it's not big enough. Um... Drawing our watershed here, right? So here's a watershed. Here's the river network. It's got tributaries. Okay. All right. So all throughout this semester, I'll try and make this 3D. This is gonna split across a page. So I'm gonna lasso this. And I will move it to the next page. Okay. So all semester we've been talking about kind of um, different things, right? So I'll put, you know, there's maybe, there's soil here and maybe there's, you know, bedrock down here. Maybe also, right, we talked about evapotranspiration, so we'll put some happy trees here. Okay. So let's just go through, and I want you all to sort of just, you know, say out loud the different sort of, you know, states or storage variables and fluxes that we have talked about over the course of the semester. And I realize it's been a long semester at this point, and it's still, you know, it's not even done yet, okay? Um, but what are, the, what are the various fluxes that we have talked, fluxes and sort of stores of water that we have talked about over the course of the semester? Just shout them out, and I'm going to label them. Precipitation. Precipitation, right? So that's an influx. Precipitation. What else? Evapotranspiration, that's an outflux. I'll put uh, ET here, right? What else? Snow storage. Snow storage. I didn't draw that. Maybe I should uh, draw like a little patch of snow here. Right, so... This is, we'll call this SWE, snow water equivalent, okay? What else? Groundwater. Groundwater, yep. So we talked about, I'll label this like H, right? Uh, let me do this. I'll put in like a little groundwater table here, although this might be a little simplistic, right? So I'll label this groundwater. 
Okay, what else? Yep, whoops. Oh, what happened there? There we go. Okay. Uh, discharge Q. Okay, what else? Talked about soil moisture. Anything else? What else did we? That's, I think that's mostly it, right? We had a unit on precip, a unit on snow, right? A unit on ET, a unit on runoff processes, a unit on soil moisture, on groundwater. Okay, that's mostly it. Okay. Um, and, and what is kind of the, I'll write this above here, but um, what is the kind of fundamental kind of key equation or, or key relationship that we've kind of come back to constantly in this class? Okay. Is it the, the influxes minus the outfluxes? Is yeah. The yes. So... So our mass balance equation, right? So mass balance. And that says something like the change in storage with respect to time is equal to the inputs. So precipitation is an input. Okay. Um, and the outputs are ET. And... The other outputs are Q, right? But what we saw is that, okay, so, you know, this is kind of the, you know, the most basic, but we talked about all of these other things, right? Like snow water equivalent, we're like, where are the storages in here, right? So in our storage equation here, this includes things like, Soil moisture, groundwater, okay. Um, our evapotranspiration here is a, a function of water availability, right? Our precipitation is both kind of rain, but also kind of snow melt, right? And our discharge here depends on things like soil moisture and groundwater again, right? You could say that this is a function of these things, right? This is a function of soil moisture. So our mass balance equation really kind of ties together like the rug and the big Lebowski, I guess, right? It ties together, that's like before you guys' time, that's so depressing. Um, it ties together all of these things we've talked about over the course of the semester, right? Like we, you know, it really is kind of the thread that runs through all of these. So, um, so what a hydrologic model is, right? So what is a, what is a hydrologic model? A hydrologic model is it's an abstraction of a hydrologic system okay and what do we what is abstraction here right like we had our previous analogy of like a door, right? And our mental model is an abstraction and that like it's not, our mental model doesn't actually open doors. It just makes internal predictions about the way the door should function. How does this apply? How does that port to a hydrologic system? What's abstraction in the context of a hydrologic system? Well, let's go back to kind of maybe the last module that I was with you for, right? And we talked about infiltration in that, in that module, right? And we talked, we derived the Richards equation and we talked about these soil characteristic curves, 
right? And if you remember, um, what did we, there was a lot of hand waving in talking about those soil characteristic curves, right? Do you remember kind of like what some of the assumptions that we've made over the course of the class are, either for, you know, either for kind of those infiltration discussions and soil characteristic curves, that's the kind of nearest one I can think about, but going back to like ET or groundwater or runoff, can you all sort of state some of the assumptions that we've made either in deriving stuff or kind of applying stuff that you all have said like even kind of intuitively like, okay, I can see why that makes the math easier, but like, I don't know, that feels like sometimes it might be a little sketchy, right? Anyone want to articulate some assumptions you may remember we've made over the course of the class that, yeah, Maddie? A lot of, a lot of things we assume to be uniform that are probably not. Yes, right? So absolutely. We assumed things like homogeneous K, right? Like the hydraulic conductivity is uniform. It's isotropic, meaning it doesn't vary in any direction, right? And we know you've gone out and sort of dug a hole or you've sort of stopped at a road cut. My dad's a geologist, so we did a lot of that when I was a kid, right? Um, you know that that's not true, right? But that's kind of the core of what this idea of abs abstraction is, right? So abstraction allows us to simplify kind of the mathematics to actually make predictions, even though we know that the real world is more complex, more heterogeneous, right, um, then, um, then the mathematics would, would lead us to believe, right? So it's a simplification, right? So an abstraction is simply a simplification that allows us to make predictions, okay? So um, it allows us, allows us to make predictions about hydrologic states and fluxes okay and And in principle, although this isn't necessarily true, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, in principle, right, again, so the features of a, a gene any generic model, right, is that it allows us to, to compare to observations to update our model, right? Um, we should be, our model should make, makes predictions of observable quantities that inform model uh, what do I want to say here inform Uh, well, we'll just leave it as informing the model, okay? Okay, so let's, let's unpack these, um, right, these, these last two bullets here, okay? So it, it's perhaps straightforward to sort of see that, in fact, a model is, is an abstraction of reality. We, we talked about some of the assumptions we've made and how we kind of had to wave our hands to make the problem easier to solve. Um, but let's unpack kind of these, let's unpack these kind of last two bullets about making predictions and then using those predictions to inform our model, okay? And this is going to, to get to the second bullet, right, leads to a discussion about why why model 
So let's ask ourselves, so the model should allow us to make predictions about things we can observe, okay, hydrologic states. Why is that, why would that be useful? I mean, just one example is that, like, up in northern Idaho, Spokane Valley Rupture and Prairie Aquifer, that has a really significant model that was made back in the early 2000s um, to try and understand how much water there is flowing through the system, what all the inputs are, and how um, water withdrawal might change as the population of eastern Washington and northern Idaho increases withdrawals. Okay. Great. So Maddie, I'm doing this for the recording. I'll, re I'll repeat that just in case the mic didn't pick it up. So Maddie brought up this idea of the, the Rathdrum River Prairie Aquifer model, which is this huge model um, in kind of eastern Washington um, that predicts kind of how the aquifer varies depending on sort of future projections about discharge in the Spokane River, as well as kind of the number of people that are sinking, sinking wells into kind of that... Um, that Rathrum, Rathrum Prairie Aquifer, right? So, so what is it we're predicting there and, and why? So like, let's, let's produce some examples here, right? So we'll say Rathrum Prairie. What are we predicting and why? What, why? So what's being predicted there, Maddie? Okay, so let's just talk about withdrawals. Withdrawals. Okay, why why would we want to know that? Uh, to understand like the height of the aquifer, or depth, however you describe that, over the entire thing for putting in wells, and then also to like know how much water you actually have. Yeah, right. So this is kind of like. Uh, Water sustainability, right? Oops. This kind of question of will we have enough water in the future, right? Or at what point is there going to be too many wells, too many straws in, in the aquifer, right? Folks have other examples that you can think of, kind of concrete ones. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's use one of my favorites, uh, Colorado River flow. What would we be predicting there? What's something we might be interested in predicting? Yeah, right, so, so future, future discharge, and why? Why would we predict that? I mean, there's the tons, of, tons of reasons, right? Like, uh, we have the Colorado River Compact. Right, we have, uh, there's water quality issues with um, Mexico. Right, so uh, um, we have a treaty with Mexico that says, hey, the salinity of the water that c crosses the border um, from the US into Mexico will be below a certain value. It gets more saline because of kind of agricultural kind of return flows and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, we have those kind of obligations to sort of meet, right? Um, and then there's the whole like hydropower issue, right? Like does, does Hoover Dam even continue to be a viable hydroelectric dam in the future? Let's think kind of closer to home. What are some other, what are some other examples? Yeah, so snowpack modeling. Let's say snowpack in the Boise River Basin. Why would we do that? To try and figure out the 
Uh, yeah. So this is uh, what we're trying to, what we're predicting, right, is like water storage. And what we're interested in is water supply. Okay. Um, so those are some good examples. Um, let's flip that a little bit and think a bit more academically for a second, right? Um, by academically, I mean like researchy. So going back to this kind of loop of the model making predictions that we can then compare to observations, and those observations are useful for informing the model. Um, as a scientist, right, as a researcher, um, what's maybe useful ab ab about that? Or what could we say sort of more broadly about that model? What does that model represent? This kind of gets more philosophical or meta. Yes, yeah. So Skyler said that this, that's actually a really uh, eloquent way of putting it, right? The, um, depending on how intricate your model is, the model itself kind of represents the frontier of our, our knowledge of hydrologic science, right? So if we use that model to make a prediction, and then we look at observations and we say, oh, those, the model is not, is, I mean, you probably already have a sense for this. The model is, is not perfect, right? Like there's, there's, there's places and times that the model is, is not working correctly. And that indicates to us kind of a gap in our knowledge, right? Like the model is, you know, let's take a snowpack as an example. The model is showing melt that is much faster than actually we observe, right? So why is that, right? Why, what is it about our assumptions, again, in, in the snowpack model? What is it about kind of the individual parameters, the, the Ks and the alphas and the betas that we use that is not correct and could be represented better to improve that model, right? So one of the reasons why, so one of the reasons we might wanna, let's take the same example here, snowpack here. We're predicting snow storage. And the why is to, is simply to improve the model. Okay, so this kind of leads us to kind of two broad classes or two, you know, very broad end uses of models, right? So, so why do we model? So there are sort of two broad categories. One is to, to make predictions that are useful in managing water resources, right? So uh, more effective management of water resources. Okay. And the other is uh, to advance the state of knowledge and understanding. Okay, now, are these two broad categories 
completely independent or is there any kind of overlap or shared goal between the two? Yeah, right? So there is this loop between the science and kind of broadly speaking the engineering, right? Is that if we're improving our knowledge of the system, if we're improving our, our fundamental understanding of the way that the processes work and we're able to capture that in models, those models will hopefully be more accurate and better accuracy hopefully conveys more confidence in the application of those models amongst both practitioners and kind of end user stakeholders, people like, you know, uh, farmers, um, people like uh, transportation folks, right? Um, that they'll have more confidence in those predictions and therefore will benefit by improving the science, right? There's a lot of caveats to that. There's a lot of kind of, you know, um, there's a lot of kind of uh, what we would refer to as STS, science and technology studies, right? The practices of how do we disseminate that information to users, right? And how do we potentially as well um, take the understanding of end users, folks like farmers, um, this comes up with in, in working with indigenous groups, right? This so-called traditional ecological knowledge, right? Folks that have long-standing understanding of the way that, for instance, something like Lake Coeur d'Alene works, right? How do we take that information and although it's not kind of bits and bytes of observations and use that to improve our, our scientific understanding, that's all kind of a whole sub-discipline. But yes, these two are kind of intimately connected, right? There's a lot of kind of caveats and important sort of science and, and uh, policy kind of stuff. But in principle, right, improved scientific understanding should lead us to more accurate predictions of the things that end users care about, which should hopefully lead to more effective management of water resources, okay? Okay. So um, that's kind of the, the why, right? These are kind of the big why reasons we would model and they are connected. So um, I want to kind of close today by talking about sort of two kind of maybe what I would call it is sort of a, a fork in the road when it comes to modeling, right? So let's go back up to our picture of our watershed here. And let's, uh, let's highlight here this Q, right? As being kind of one of the big fundamental things that we really want to model. Okay, so let's focus change this okay and then how did I ask this question at the very beginning okay fundamental types of models okay so fundamental types of hydrologic Okay. Okay. So focusing on discharge. And why why is discharge kind of a fundamental, you know, discharge represents the amount of flow for instance in the Boise River. What are some real, what's a real quick kind of just listing of applications for which that's important because there's tons. Right, that's why we're kind of focusing on discharge. So what are some of the applications? Like why would we want to know or predict flow in the Boise River? Irrigation. What's that? 
irrigation, right? How much, how much water is going to be available for sort of supplying irrigators in the Treasure Valley in the summertime? Other reasons, more like an engineering one. Yeah, so, so flow velocity is a good example, right? Like we might want to know flow velocity because that relates to sort of our, our you know, how quickly will banks erode? How, you know, will we sort of during a, a big flow, will we sort of, um, uh, will we wind up kind of undercutting bridge piers and stuff like that that would endanger the st structural integrity of things like the Broadway Street Bridge, right? Um, so, you know, flood control is another one, right? Are we going to get flooding? Uh, there's some ecological ones, right? Like, is the flow going to go below some value at which, you know, we're going to start having fish kills or have kind of thermal issues, right? Uh, other water quality things. Um, uh, we need to know uh, how much flow there is because we have some idea of how much Nitrogen or phosphorus is going in, but it's the concentrations that matter. So when we mix the mass of pollutants with the, the discharge, we can get a concentration, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we can get at some water quality issues. So discharge, it turns out, is sort of very fundamentally kind of important, okay? So there's different ways of coming up, right? So what we want is we want... We want a model that predicts discharge as a function of time, and that will be a function of what? What are some things that discharge would be a function of? Okay, so I'm going to call this, so uh, cross-sectional area, right? So we're going to say something like, like phi. This is like uh, properties of the watershed and river. Oops. Okay. River. Okay, so we'll lump all of those together. So yeah, so cross-sectional properties, things like Manning's N, but we'll also include in that things like soil properties, our porosity, right? All of those kind of parameters, properties of the, of the watershed. What else? What are kind of the big ones? Precipitation, right? And maybe some other kind of meteorological variables, right? So... This is precipitation. This is other met, okay? So at the end of the day, our model, our model boils down to just kind of a mathematical representation, right? It says that our watershed is just a function, right? It's a function that, um, you know, it's a certain kind of function. So in, in math and things like DIFFEQ, you would talk about this as a so-called transfer function. But it's a function that transfers things like precipitation and meteorological fluxes, given some properties of the watershed and transfers that into a discharge, right? A time series of flow in our river, okay? That's all it is. But... There's the big how, right? There's the big, how do we do that, okay? How do we take, right, what does, what does the form of this function take, right? Like, you know, that's, we're just saying that it's a function. There's a lot of things that are functions. Sine is a function. Exponential is a function, right? You can have nonlinear functions like step functions, okay? So what... Right, what is the, how do we get that, that functional form, 
right? Something that will give us numbers. So we tend to think about this in hydrology as in, in sort of two pretty different and fundamentally, um, fundamentally kind of distinct ways, right? And one of them, so let's say how, right? How How do we come up with f of phi, p, and t, okay? And there's two fundamentally kind of different ways, right? One approach says, and these are kind of fundamentally fundamentally different. So one approach, approach one, says, right, um, watersheds are complex, and processes not well understood. So it would posit that we should come up with um, proposed a conceptual model that contains few parameters but can easily be calibrated. We'll talk about what calibration is on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, okay? So that's approach one, right? Um, and this is what's known as conceptual modeling, whoops. conceptual modeling. Okay. So in this approach, we're sort of saying, hey, we basically like we've we spent the whole semester kind of deriving a bunch of equations and all of those equations have a bunch of assumptions and hand waving associated with them. There's any number of different kind of parameters that have come up over the, right? So there's all those parameters of the Brooks, Corey, and Van Gnukten curves. There's the Manning's N. There's, you know, the, the you know, resistance, you know, resistances in our evapotranspiration. There's all of this meteorological data we need. There's temperature and pressure and humidity and long wave radiation and short wave radiation. We need to know stuff about the snow, right? So we need to know how the snow densifies. We need precipitation. Um, this approach says that's a lot, right? And there's a lot of opportunities there to kind of go wrong. So let's come up with a far more simplified model of the system that predicts the thing that we want, discharge, takes the thing that we know controls discharge, precipitation, and maybe temperature, but otherwise has as few parameters as possible, like maybe three parameters that we can kind of tune to make sure that our predictions fit closely with, as, as closely with the observations as possible, okay? 
All right, um, and I'll draw a diagram of sort of what how this looks differently. Okay, so approach two. Um, so that was one sort of philosophical statement. What's a, what's a counter philosophical statement? What if, what if we, right? So again, the thread that has led through the course, the class has been conservation of mass, right? Mass conservation. Um, but along the way, right, as we have derived all of these other kind of different equations that we use to represent evapotranspiration, discharge, groundwater, what's kind of an un undercurrent of all of those, all of those approaches? What have we kind of relied on philosophically to guide us as we've developed them? Like, did we just kind of make stuff up or Yeah, exactly. We relied on physics, right? We reverted to physics and we said, well, physics tells us mass is conserved. Physics tells us if energy is conserved, then this will be true, right? Physics tells us that the movement of water from the liquid phase to the vapor phase has to be a function of, right? It has to be a function of things like the vapor pressure deficit. Right, so a, a contrary argument to this approach one is to say, yes, watersheds are complex and the processes are not well understood, but we've come up with relationships for those processes. We haven't done it willy-nilly. We've started off from physical principles, right? So our approach here is that Relying on physical principles, um, allows us to derive generic models. Right? And what I mean by generic is that, okay, if I have a model of the Boise River, the Boise River system, and it's complex, it's represented in the physics, it's representing the physics, okay? Um, if I want to now model, for instance, the Big Wood River, the characteristics of that watershed are different, okay? It's got a different elevation profile. The precipitation is probably different. It's got different topography. It's a different size, right? That model that I created for the Boise River that's based on my physics, like does physics still apply in the Big Wood River? Does physics still apply in like the Chattahoochee River? Yeah. Physics, if there's some alt earth out there, right? Physics in principle still applies there, right? They it probably wasn't Newton, but those same physical principles should apply. So the models that I develop under approach two are more portable, right? I can even port them in principle to places I don't have that discharge data to calibrate the other model. Okay, um, but the physics should still work, right? F still equals MA, okay? So here we develop a physics-based model that may have more parameters than 
but whose parameters are physically meaningful. Okay, meaning full. Okay. Okay, so how, let's like put a real quick visual to this as we wrap up. How would this potentially look like conceptually different? Okay, so a, um, a conceptual model may just look like a bucket, right? may look like kind of just a fancy bucket. So here is our bucket, right? It maybe has a outlet at the bottom. It maybe has like another outlet here, right? A spillover outlet. There's precipitation coming in. There's some kind of water storage variable in here, but it's making our predictions of stream flow, right? And this says something like, you know, Q is equal to, you know, some function you know, maybe like a power function. So like a alpha times this storage variable to some exponent. And we still have mass conservation, right? So ds dt still equals p minus q in this, right? Okay. So that's a simple model, right? This says that, okay, we now have a representation, something that links storage with discharge, right? So we can take the time derivative of both of these, right? And then we just have a prediction of discharge as a function of, you know, these parameters in our precipitation. And then all we have to do is find our time series of discharge that's observed at like a gauge and tune, tweak alpha and beta until we get the best fit possible between our predicted discharge and our observed discharge, right? We'll talk about what that process looks like next time. It's called calibration, right? So that's a simple conceptual model, right? Okay. I can't give you a sort of similar picture of a, a simple physics-based model because it's not so simple, right? We have to do things like take that Richards equation that I talked about how is a nonlinear partial differential equation. We have to discretize and solve it, right? So it becomes more complicated. But it contains terms, right? So these alpha and beta terms, these alpha and beta terms aren't going to mean a lot physically. Right? I can't go and dig a soil pit and measure alpha and beta. And more so, right, getting to that other point, if I, if I calibrate this model for the Boise River, the chances that alpha and beta are the same for the Big, river, Big Wood River are exceptionally small. It's probably not, I, I need that data to calibrate the model, okay? Although my physics-based model is gonna be more complex, it's gonna contain parameters like the hydraulic conductivity right? Parameters that I can go say, okay, I can, I can get some information on that. I can take some measurements, right, in the field. I can do something like a slug test or a pump test. I can look it up in a book, and it should still be the same hyd hydraulic conductivity, okay? Okay, so we'll talk about... Um, Next time, um, I'll introduce kind of the fundamental process of calibrating models, right? Um, it turns out that 
you know, because we had to do that hand waving, no model is like truly only based on physics, right? We always have some assumptions there that result in some parameters that need calibration. So we'll talk about generally what calibration is, how we do it, and what some kind of performance measures that we use uh, to, um, that we use to decide how, how good of a model we have are, okay? Okay, um, hope you all have a great Thanksgiving holiday and um, I'll post this to Canvas. So see you a week from next Tuesday.